When you look at the skills and I guess the leadership sort of technique or style that works at this extreme environment where you're essentially leading as if your life depends upon it, I mean why wouldn't I guess you want to bring those attributes into a more normal workplace where there's not those dangers but you have team members who are following you as if their life depends upon it. Patrick, great to talk to you. You're in a very different position from a lot of the leaders we've spoken to. You know, you're not necessarily doing it in the office all day and, and leading the troops. You're leading people up to the top of mountains and dangerous mountains at that. How different is that, do you think? Mm. Um, in some regards, I think it's quite different um, because there's obviously a significant threat of life and that's maybe not something you're encountering in your office environment. Um, but in another regard, it, in some, it, I guess it's actually quite similar. I think that the issues you deal with um, leading people in an extreme environment versus in not such an extreme environment, you can certainly learn a lot from that, that extreme environment. So, you know, lessons from the edge, I guess, I think you can apply to everyday business. When you are under those challenges, you know, as you say, their lives often depend on someone who is leading them. They have to have total trust in you. What other sort of attributes do they look for in you? Um, I think it's a, it's a combination of, as you said, trust. Um, I think um, uh, believing the sincerity of the leader um, and believing in their competence, um, their own experience, um, so that leader can effectively and safely guide them through what is or what can be a fairly dangerous circumstance and ultimately um, achieve whatever the goal is. And in most cases on a mountaineering expedition, it's obviously reaching the summit and getting back down safely. In a corporate setting, people have a lot of time to get to know their staff and what makes them tick and what makes them excel and that sort of thing. When you're doing an expedition, you have to get to know people very quickly and they have to get to know you very quickly. So how do you build that rapport? Yeah, well, it's a little different to the corporate sector, I guess. Not only um, it's, it's less time, but it also is very, very compressed because if your average expedition is, say, 30 days up to on Everest, it might be 60 days, um, you actually do spend quite a lot of time with one another, uh, living in each other's sort of space um, and often going through some fairly harrowing and intense experiences. So you do get to know your teammates fairly well um, in that regard. Um, but it certainly can prove tricky at the outset um, when you're, if you're leading an expedition and if, if, you have two, if you have new team members who you're not particularly familiar with, very quickly you're trying to assess what their motivations are for being there um, and, and that is particularly important I think to, to, to determine what their motivations are because then it's easier to, to um, I guess to not only motivate them but also just to, just to predict how they're going to react to um, a, an environment which is often changing. Um, your life can depend on their behaviour as well. That, that's the thing, you're caught in this together, aren't you? Absolutely, absolutely. And when I started out mountaineering, when I was essentially just learning the ropes, so to speak, myself, and, and probably the easiest way for somebody to learn the ropes in the Himalayas is to join commercial expeditions. And the, so this was in the early days when I used to sign up for, for expeditions where I'd meet team members in Kathmandu or, or in Islamabad in Pakistan or whatever for the first time, and you're going to be tied into a rope with them. And very quickly I realised that was um, really not my preference because I felt that was taking on too big a risk. Um, so I then that's when I sort of morphed into basically just doing my own climbing and, and, and establishing a, a good working relationship with a, with a number of, of uh, uh, Sherpa friends of mine and that's a much sort of safer way because yeah your lives do depend upon one another and, and if you're tied into that rope you want to be sure that, um, that uh, they're as competent as you and hopefully even more competent than you. <laughs> yeah, th th there's whole challenges, are, are, you know, you're having to make decisions based on the conditions and, and that sort of thing. Where does the element of a good leader come into that? Because you're having to rely upon, you know, external factors, not necessarily your ability as a leader, or am I wrong? Mm. Yeah, I certainly think that the leader needs to be fairly, um, fairly good at reading the uh, environment, so really um, outward looking rather than being introspective. I think that, um, and certainly I've found that times when I've been, you know, quite scared in the mountains, I, I, I'm actually quite scared of heights. Um, so that's been a bit of an impediment for my mountaineering career. But I guess having the ability to try and look outwardly and really focus on the environment um, to, to try and ascertain what's changing um, is the best way to control your own feelings as well. Um, and, and I think a, a leader who also leads other people in those sort of changing circumstances, I think that you know, if that leader can be innovative and adaptive um, and that's going to help the whole team get through circumstances which are not entirely predictable.
Give me some examples of where it's been challenging, you know, based on where you've been, the conditions you've been under, maybe the, 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 the nature of some of them struggling with injuries or whatever it might be. Sure, sure. Um, a couple of different examples. In 2009, I was on a mountain called Barantse, which is a 7,200 metre peak in the Nepali Himalaya, not far from Everest. And um, we got to an altitude of about 6,900 metres. This was on our summit push. So we're only about three or four hours um, climbing away from the actual summit, about, about you know, 300 vertical metres below the top. But we came to a, a very steep uh, snow slope, which was, was very uh, loosely, con it wasn't consolidated snow, it snowed overnight. And we had a 2,000 metre drop down to our left. And, and, and the summit wasn't far, but we had to cross this, this slope. And a 2,000 metre drop straight down on our left hand side, every time we tried to cross that snow, that snow slope, the, the snow would actually give way beneath our feet. And a, a, a difficult decision because you're physically exhausted, it's the end of a month long expedition, you've invested a huge amount of energy and finances into getting to the top and to get so close but then to be forced with this conundrum so to speak, but in the end it was actually pretty straightforward because we realised well, the risk of that snow slope actually avalanching and taking us 2,000 metres straight down was too great. And we thought, well, we're close enough to the summit and that'll, that'll do for today. <laughs> so that's certainly an example of, of where, where we had to, I guess, make some fairly sensible and strong decisions um, when it would be tempting to possibly just push it a little bit further. Um, but I have had friends who have, who have made calls like that and haven't has been fortunate and have, have passed away in the mountains. So that, that sort of certainly hits home when, when you see um, that happening. Um, that's one good example. Um, another, a different example was just more recently, only a few months ago, I was leading an expedition to Amma de Blam, which is uh, a 6,800 metre mountain just down the valley from Everest. And it's a very steep and quite imposing and technically challenging mountain. And um, I, wasn't, uh, I wasn't probably as fit as I should have been uh, for that role of leading, leading this group of four climbers. And I was really actually quite overwhelmed by fear and I, and I struggled to internalise that um, and um, having only recently found out that, that, that I was to become a father for the first time and I found that to be incredibly confronting and, and I really questioned what was I actually doing on this mountain um, and um, if I was there just on my own expedition I would have turned around and left but I, I felt that I had an obligation to the team that I was there to help them get up the mountain. That was my first task. How did you make sure that they didn't see the fear? Well look at times they probably did see the fear um, and that's something I really only realised afterwards. I think that it really is particularly important to control that. Mm. How did um, it affect them do you think? Look, I, I, I mean um, I don't know if it significantly affected them but just at times I remember thinking I shouldn't have said that or I shouldn't have done that because you know that just may I guess undermine any you know some confidence that they have in me so really what I actually did was an interesting way in 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 my own tent in the evenings I'd pull out my video camera and I'd sort of have a video diary record my thoughts that was a way that I could actually get those feelings out onto camera and essentially recognize those feelings of fear um, and then decide they're there, but I'm really just going to have to deal with them in a week's time whenever we're off the mountain. And then once I'm back in base camp, that's when I'll properly be able to sort of process that fear. And, and that was ultimately what I did. And, and we got three of the four clients up onto the summit and we had a fantastic expedition and I think everybody really enjoyed it as well. Did you learn a lot yourself as a result of going through that? And, and you know, people often say, you know, your leadership is all about experiences, you know, some good, some bad. How has that changed you? Yeah, look, a huge amount, and, and for me, my entire mountaineering career, sort of 15 years long, has been one of constant learning and experiential learning, I guess. Um, I've pretty much made every mistake you can make in the book in mountaineering. Um, uh, I've suffered high altitude illness before, pulmonary edema, where I've almost been killed in 2006. That was actually on Amit Blam, so it was six years later that I was able to return and actually successfully climb that mountain. But it's only through learning through all those mistakes that I've made that I've, I've really gained a huge respect for the Himalayas and I guess in particular the dangers of, of extreme altitude. We, we were, we were on, on our summit push on Everest, we, we were caught in a traffic jam at about 8,600 metres just below the south summit of, of Everest. So the level of oxygen up that high is about a quarter what's available at sea level. And at the front of this queue of climbers, there are about 40 climbers in this, this large expedition and I was just there with my Sherpa mates. We ran into the back of them and for two hours we couldn't move. Nobody was moving and 
the guy at the front of this queue couldn't get up this rock and ice. And people were incredibly complacent and I was the lone sort of Aussie reckless climber yelling and swearing at people to get out of the way because they were all going to die if they weren't too careful. And, and that was quite alarming to see that complacency. And I think that probably is through lack of experience and respect. But that was strong leadership. That was experience telling you you had to do something because it was dangerous. Yeah, I guess so. And I mean, I'd, I'd been on an, another 8,000 metre mountain only, only if you know, half a year earlier, and I, that was when I'd really learnt to respect that 8,000 metres in particular and above um, is, a, is a very, very dangerous environment and there's very little room for error. And, um, and, and I, I certainly felt that we didn't have any time to waste. Once you're above 8,000 metres, you really can't, you, your minutes are ticking by. I mean, the human body can't survive for long up there. I want to explore that idea of how you can take your, your, your experiences from up in the mountain to bring it into a corporate sector and how you can work with leaders and, uh, and others to better the way that they perform. How does that work? Um, I guess it's built on the premise um, that in this sort of extreme environment, you know, at the edge, um, leaders need to be adaptive and innovative. Um, and that it's when you look at the skills and I guess the leadership sort of technique or style that works at this extreme environment um, um, where you're essentially leading as if your life depends upon it. Um, I mean, why wouldn't I guess you want to bring those attributes into a more uh, normal workplace where there's not those dangers, but you have team members who are following you as if their life depends upon it? Because when your life depends upon somebody else, um, you know, you, I guess you, you, you believe in what they're doing. Um, they are protecting your life and um, the outcomes can be fairly great, I think. Um, my experience and in some of the team building sort of workshops that I've run in, in, in the Stirling Ranges in the southwest of the state and also in, in other areas, I've seen certainly you take the individual outside of the comfort zone and it's really, really confronting and at the time nobody really likes being outside of their comfort zone and I don't really like it either. Um, but afterwards, once you've passed through that process and you then reflect back on what you actually learnt in that, in, in that extreme environment, um, I think the capacity to learn and the capacity to see how team members uh, interact with one another, I think the, the, the capacity for learning is, is, is quite significant. Interesting in the conversations we've had in this space with some, some you know, big leaders that they've all benefited from having some difficult experiences, you know, mm. some, some sort of life-changing experience where you know, their, their decision-making at the time was going to have profound uh, impact. Yeah. Is that the same sort of thing here, that when you put people under that physical extreme, they're going to naturally be changed as a result of that? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think there's... Um, I the, the, the author, a, a great author on leadership, Warren Bennis, um, in his book, uh, uh, Learning to Lead, um, he talks about some of the, the greatest leaders of the world having been through crucibles um, in their lives, significantly difficult periods of life that they've had to come through, sort of almost like the, um, you know, the, the steel being forged in the fire, so to speak, and, and that the, the, the really good leadership sort of capacity comes out of that. And whilst in you know, some of the exercises I might be trying to run, I'm not trying to put people through that ex such an extreme um, extent, I think that the, the general theory still applies that, that, um, that through, I guess, negotiating adverse conditions, we can certainly learn a lot about ourselves as individuals. We can learn a lot about our teammates. And I think for, for a good leader, I think you've got to be self-aware. I think, I think self-awareness is a really important trait um, of a good leader and also being, a, being aware of your teammates. And so I think that, that we, can, we can learn from those experiences. And if there was going to be one thing that people will remember you for, what would it be? One thing that I was remembered for, um, look, I guess it would be, um, I'm going to say a few things, essentially being a good person, a good partner, a family member, father and a friend, somebody with a, with a big heart who, who embraced life with a passion. It's pretty good to be remembered for. Yeah. <laughs> nice to talk to you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Cheers.